Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John's Gospel, chapter 11. In chapter 10, we saw Jesus as the Good Shepherd and the Son of God. In this chapter, we'll see Jesus as the Prince of Life. We've mentioned on several occasions that John chose seven signs, specific signs for the reader to see and understand who Jesus is. And if you remember, the first one was at a wedding of Cana. It's where Jesus turned the water into wine. We come to the seventh sign in this chapter where we're not at a wedding but a funeral. And I believe it's interesting, it's not by accident that we see the bookends of these signs that John gives us. The first at a wedding at one of the gladdest times in human life, and the last at a funeral, one of the saddest times in human life. And I believe, among many things the Lord's trying to get us to see and understand, is that He is Lord of both and everything and occasion in between. He doesn't change whether life is glad or it's sad, whether we're on the mountain or whether we're in the valley. He is still Lord, and we should keep our eyes on Him. We've got 57 verses to cover. So that's the end of the introduction. Right? Let's jump right in. The first thing we're going to see if you like outlines like myself is the sickness of Lazarus. John says, now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany. Bethany's about two miles away from Jerusalem. The town of Mary and her sister Martha. No doubt these three individuals were well known. Otherwise, John would have gave more explanation of who they are. So he just said, it's Lazarus, it's Mary, it's Martha, and he just assumed that most of the people reading would know exactly who that was. But for our sake, he says this in verse 2, it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. We won't touch on that because we'll look at it Next time, Lord willing. Verse 3, Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. We could pause and ponder that for the rest of our time together. Think about those words. He whom thou lovest is sick sick. Lazarus was loved, but suffering. Lazarus was loved, but suffering. Now, we don't like suffering. And we oftentimes make the mistake of thinking that if we're suffering, we're not loved. After we get through the book of Esther, we're going to go into the book of Job, and his comforters had that theology. If you're suffering, something is wrong, and God is getting you. We should always interpret our suffering by God's love. We should always interpret our suffering by God's love, never interpreting his love by our suffering. We, we, we link those things together to our own hurt. And it's not biblical to think, oh, I'm suffering, therefore the Lord is upset. Or he's distant, or he's forgotten me. He whom thou lovest. Uh, somebody here needs 
to hear that this morning. He whom thou lovest is sick. Suffering is not a sign. Sickness is not a sign that God is upset with you. Although I must confess I have felt that way in my life. I've had those seasons of sickness. I've had those seasons of suffering. And I've doubted the Lord's love during those times. But the scripture reinforces the truth. The question we always ask is why? Why is this happening to me? Ever ask why? I'm the only one. You are such a spirit. Oh, there's a few. Uh, the rest of you are so spiritual. It's such an honor to pastor such a rock solid group of people who have never in the face of suffering said, Lord, why? Well, good news. Jesus is about to answer the question. And it is my earnest prayer personally for me, but for all of us as a body, that the Holy Spirit would help us to grasp this truth. It's beyond the flesh. It's beyond human comprehension. But notice what Jesus says. This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. When is the last time that you linked the suffering that you were going through, the trial that you were experiencing, the pain, the, the tiredness of struggling from day to day, getting up and pushing yourself, pressing forward when you didn't feel like getting out of bed. When was the last time you said, Lord, this is for your glory? See, because we, we sometimes get locked into this carnal mentality of thinking like humans. And we think that glory comes from great victory in battle. Glory comes from accomplishing great feats. Glory comes from amassing great wealth. Those are the things that we link to glory. But Jesus says, Lazarus is laying on that bed this day for the glory of God. I pray God helps us to understand this, to comprehend this. And it's freeing too because we like to link glory with all of this stuff that I mentioned. But God's glory is eternal. It's transcendent. God is glorified in all things. And in Corinthians chapter 10, Paul says this, whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. So every groan, oh, oh, whew. Every ache, every pain, every tear, every, every bit of sorrow, depression, oppression, anxiety, be glorified. When we get to chapter 17, spoiler alert, Jesus is praying to the Father. And he said, Father, be glorified. He says, glorify thy son with the glory which I had with you in the beginning. I have glorified you while I was on this earth. Jesus understood. He knew. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. We should learn from him. Matthew 11. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn of me. Everything that he did, he did for the Father's glory. As a matter of fact, the writer of Hebrews says, he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. Suffering is not a waste of time. It's not a dead season of your life unless you let it die. Suffering is a tool in the hand of Almighty God for His eternal purposes in your life and even beyond your life. To the lives of those around who are witnessing, God can use suffering, sickness, sorrow, sadness for His glory. 
I don't know about you, but that encourages me. He says, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister. I love this. We're never going to finish 57 verses. There's just so much stuff here. I absolutely love this because Martha always gets a bad rap. I've been a Martha. Everybody praises Mary. We're going to talk about Mary more next time we get together, Lord willing. But we, we beat Martha up. Nobody wants to be a Martha. But the Holy Spirit, being who he is, being God who loves us, right here says Martha and doesn't even mention Mary at all. Her sister. So when you often feel like a Martha... You're struggling to be more like a Mary. You, you feel condemned, you feel beat up, you feel discouraged, and you think, man, I'm never going to remember this verse. Because you might not be where the Lord wants you to be, but he loves you the same. He says, Martha and her sister, oh, and Lazarus. You know, he, he's the star of the chapter in him too. But Martha's list, listed first. That, that encourages me. But then verse 6, things get a little tricky. We, 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 if we're not careful, we'll get stuck in the quagmire. When he heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Have you ever been guilty like me of thinking that I prayed? Where's the answer? You said, ask and I'd receive. Where's the answer? Timing. Don't you just love time? We were stuck in time, this time-space continuum. And we forget because we're stuck in time that God isn't. We make a grave mistake when we're going, Lord, Lord, tick. Tick, tick, running out of time. Do you know that God never runs out of time? He's never, he's never late. He, he's never looking at the clock. He's never worried. The one you loved is sick. We would think Jesus would have packed his bags, maybe even left his bags. You know, because after all, Jesus is, is, is God. God is love. And so love would just stop everything, drop everything, and rush and run to the aid of the one that is loved. Because if that doesn't happen, we'll make the mistake in thinking that love isn't love. Because we want to define love by our terms and our conditions. And he stands still. What do you do when God isn't moving? Do you know that God waits? God waits. What in the world does God have to wait for? But he waits. And in Ecclesiastes, he tells us to everything, there is a time and a season for every purpose under heaven. Even though God is eternal, God understands time. Just because he's eternal, he, doesn't, he hasn't forgotten that we're dust. He hasn't forgotten that we are stuck in time. And I wonder, John doesn't tell us about this, but, but, but Martha and Mary are back at the house. The house, we're going to find out, is just crowded by people. If you've ever been around someone that's sick and it's that time where they're calling everyone around or maybe you've lost a loved one and you're just kind of numb in the middle of it. It's just a fog of war. And, and even though you're just surrounded, you just kind of wish everybody would just leave. And they're sitting there and they're wondering, is he coming? I can almost picture Martha going to the door. Oh, what is he doing? What is he doing? You know, Mary's like, is he here yet? I don't know, let me go check. No, no he's not. What is, what is God doing? I've been praying 
and I've been praying, and I've been asking, and I've been asking, and I've been praying, and I've been praying. What do I do when God waits? What should I do when God waits? You're not going to like the answer. Wait. You wait. If he's waiting, you wait, because a delay is not a denial. We think that delays are denials. We think because God's not acting and working at our drumbeat, at our command, that he's not going to work. But God is always working and not just working. We don't just have the assurance that God is always working. Romans 8, 28, he's working for our good, even in sickness, even in sorrow, even when he hasn't moved in two days and the clock is still ticking, and we're running out of time. He stays in one place. You know we love the fruit of the Spirit, don't we? Love, joy, peace. We love those fruit because we benefit from those fruit. Oh, love, joy, peace. But then he says, long-suffering. Whoa, wait a minute, no, no. hold up. Have I told you that I don't like all fruit? <laughs> Just most fruit. Long suffering. James says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh. I don't want to memorize the second part of that verse. Patience. Then he says, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing he waits for two whole days and then verse 7 after that he saith to his disciples let us go into Judea again his disciples say unto him master the Jews of late sought to stone thee and goest thou thither again don't you realize you're a wanted man the last time we were there they were wanting to kill you and you want to go back Jesus answered are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. We won't spend a lot of time there, although there's a lot there. But although that God is outside of time, he understands time, and here Jesus, God in the flesh, in time, is saying there's a time for everything which means you and I need to understand. You work when it's day. The darkness is coming. Now, in this case, he's talking about his passion. He's talking about the cross. He's saying, I've got a work to do for my father. I've got a set time to do it. I'm on his schedule, and it would behoove you, it would behoove me to ask ourselves, what time is it? What am I supposed to be doing? After all, I'm supposed to be glorifying him in every situation and circumstance in my life. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. I love how the scripture uses sleep to describe death for the believer. It softens it a whole bunch, doesn't it? I'm going to death. I'm going to sleep. I kind of like sleep. I, and I don't know about you. Some of you are like, yeah, I'm, a, I'm in agreement. Some of you are like, what is he talking about? I think we may, maybe need to open up the coffee room <laughs> again because this is not kind of working without it. I, I mean, there, there's a connection between church. Uh, anyway, <laughs> he says, our friend Lazarus sleepeth. Isn't it interesting? He's still our friend. He's still our friend. He's sleeping, Jesus says, but he's still our friend. He's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. He's the Prince of life. And his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'd do well. He's going to be okay. He's taking a nap. He needs his rest. This is good for him. I just heard the young people are like, yes, sleep. More sleep. We heard it in church. It's spiritual. Right? He's going to do well if he sleeps. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking a rest and sleep. And then Jesus breaks it down. I love it. The Lord reduces it to the ridiculous for people like me. 
Lazarus is dead. Oh, okay, I get it now, yeah. Oh, yeah, now that you put it like that, I, I get it, I get it. He's dead. And then Jesus says something that blows my mind, verse 15, and I'm glad. It reminds me of a verse in Isaiah 53 that says, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. God the Father struck his son with joy. Now, I know, my, I don't know about yours. You know, you, you guys are super spiritual and super smart. My little pea brain right now is just, he's on its tippy toes and still can't see nothing. Right? I'm just trying. He, it, please, it pleased him to bruise his son. They're one. I and the Father are one we studied last week. That's love. It's incomprehensible love beyond my imagination. He says, and I am glad that I wasn't there. Why? He answers. For the intent ye may believe. Everything God is doing in my life, everything God is doing in your life, everything John has written in this gospel, in this book, is for one sole purpose, so that you will believe, so that you will believe, so that you will believe. God wants you to believe, to believe, to believe. He says, I waited so you would believe. What? I waited so you'd believe. I would think if you'd answered me like that, I would believe. No, Gordon, I waited so that you would believe. Sometimes God's got to take everything that you're leaning on away so that he's the only thing to lean on because that's faith we think oh faith is what that super preachers told me faith is that magic wand that I can just whoo, and then God's just gonna do that's not faith that's not faith faith is waiting as long as he waits that's faith. Jesus says, I, I'm glad I wasn't there for your sakes. Well, we got to speed it up. You guys are slow this morning. Come on, get with it. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We move from the sickness of Lazarus to the sorrow over Lazarus, starting in verse 17. He says, then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave for four days already. Oh, I skipped, I skipped, verse 16. How could I do that? Verse 16, then said Thomas, which was called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. I love Thomas. He's another guy that gets a bad rap. You know, doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. Oh, don't be a doubting Thomas. He was a doubter. Actually, he was more than a doubter. He was a disbeliever because he says, unless I can put my hands in the print of his hands and thrust my hand into his side, I'm going to doubt. He didn't say that. He says, I will not believe. He wasn't a doubter. He was a disbeliever at the moment, but he was also the first of the disciples to say, my Lord and my God. But though he was a doubter, he was devoted. He was devoted. And the scripture takes note of that when we get to John chapter 20, because while all the other disciples are hiding in an upper room, because they were afraid they were next, Thomas wasn't there. He was the only one not hiding with the rest of the chickens. Yes, a doubter, but devoted. And the enemy this morning would love to remind you of one area of your life and try to get you to forget another area of your life. And the Holy Spirit this morning, I believe in this chapter among a myriad of things, is trying to get you to understand, yes, he knows you're struggling with this, that, or the other, but he also recognizes these other things in your life. Just because you're struggling here doesn't make you a loser. Doesn't mean God says, done with you. Throw him, throw her out with the trash. That's not the way God operates. Well, anyway, back to 17. Four days already. I'm glad we didn't skip that. If it would have been left to me, we'd have missed that good word right there, but the Holy Spirit's not gonna let that happen. 
Verse 18, now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off, two miles. 19, and many of the Jews were there with Mary, Martha and Mary, Mary to comfort them. That's all man can do at a time like that is just comfort. But Jesus can do more. Verse 20, then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, and Mary was, sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask God, God will give it thee. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. I know in the sweet by and by, Lord, it's all going to be okay. I know that you're going to fix it later. Just not now. We need some now faith. We need more now faith, not, not sweet by and by faith. Sweet by and by faith's okay. Don't lose sweet by and by faith, but, but add to your sweet by and by faith some right here and now faith. Jesus said unto her, this is the sixth I am that John puts in here. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. I'm the resurrection and the life. So all of these I am's, are you hungry? Jesus is the bread of life. Are you in darkness? Jesus is the light of the world. Are you lost? He's the gateway into the fold. Are you hopeless? He's the good shepherd. Are you dead? He's the resurrection and the life. See, our solution is not in a something. It's in a someone. We need to learn that our solution is not in a something, it's in a someone. We need to go to him. He's the answer to all of our problems. Well, verse 28, when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister secretly, said, the master has come and calleth for thee. And as soon as she heard that, she rose up quickly, she came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. I, I wonder this morning if there's anyone here who's still trying to struggle with grief, still trying to deal with the whys, still trying to come to grips with what has happened. If that's you, if you're there, you need to find the place where the Lord is. And you need to get alone with him because that's where you're gonna find healing and wholeness. The Jews that were there with her in the house that comforted her when they saw that Mary, that she rose up hastily and went and followed her, saying she goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet. Now she's about to say the, almost the exact words of her sister. The words are the same, but the posture is different. We'll talk about the posture next week. It's tempting now, but I'm already out of time. I'm on borrowed time already. But she fell at his feet, and she says the same thing. Lord, if, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. We need to learn to take our ifs to Jesus. We need to remember where the ifs come from. If comes from the enemy. We need to take our ifs to the Lord. Because all of his promises are yes and amen. But, but notice, Martha comes in one way. Mary comes in another way. Martha's wanting to know, are you still in control? You know, she's type A. I can relate to her. She's like, get her done. You know, she's that kind of person. She wants all of her little duckies in a row. And she comes to Jesus and, and she's like, yeah, I know, I know. Some day in the sweet by and by, but, but, but if you'd have been here right now, this is my problem. This is where I'm hung up. This is where I'm stuck. She needed to know that God was still in control, that Jesus was still in control. Mary shows up. She falls down at his feet and she's weeping. She isn't even worried about control. She wants to know, do you still care? One comes intellectually to the Lord. The other one comes emotionally to the Lord, but he's Lord of both. And notice, to the first, Jesus doesn't say, how dare you question me the resurrection and the life? Never. But he also doesn't say to Mary, stop your crying. Toughen up. 
Be brave, be bold, be bad. He, he doesn't. He doesn't do either because he's the solution to both. That was for somebody. I heard one amen, so I'm glad that person got it. <laughs> when Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. He groaned in the spirit. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. This is an amazing chapter. What Jesus does here solidifies beyond any shadow of a doubt who he is. One of the most amazing miracles known to man. Jesus is going to rise in three days. Lazarus has been here four. But what I see happen here moves me in a way that the miracle doesn't. Because I've never struggled with the idea that God is God. He's God. I mean, when you think God is God, that means he's God. And <laughs> don't need a lot of explanation. You can't understand that. But, but the explanation is unnecessary for me. Maybe it's just because I'm so simple-minded. He's God. Of course he's God. He can do anything. Nothing's impossible with him. Don't so much struggle there as I do with... It's so weird. I'm a... I'm a I just, I just realized how messed up I am. Right here. I'm, I'm so much like Martha and Mary. At the same time, I've got it bad. Right? I, I get that he's in control. I know that he's in control, but I struggle sometimes when I feel out of control. Does he care? Yes. That was three honks, too. <laughs> In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. <laughs> he was troubled, verse 34. Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35, Jesus wept. He wept. Now you've heard, and it's true. This is the shortest verse in the Bible, if, if you're looking at it in the English. In the English, this is the shortest. Jesus wept. God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, the unstoppable one, the uncontrollable one, the unmovable one, tears trickling down his face. If that doesn't move you, you are stuck bad. He wept. Now, that's the shortest verse in the English. But when you look at it in the Greek, it's not the shortest verse in the Bible. In the Greek, it's 16 characters. 1 Thessalonians 5 I think it's 17, 18, somewhere up in there, is actually the shortest. 14 characters rejoice evermore. Rejoice evermore. Remember the bookends? The gladdest day, the wedding of Cana. The saddest day, the death of Lazarus. Jesus wept. Hebrews 4, we have a high priest who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He can be touched. He knows. Isaiah 53, he's a man of sorrows and acquainted with griefs. And because of that, I can, you can, we can rejoice. We can rejoice, Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Jesus said, rejoice because your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. It starts with the wedding in John's gospel. And can I remind you quickly this morning? Everything in our lives ends with a wedding. Everything ends with a wedding. Revelation chapter 19. Blessed are they who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I can rejoice no matter what's going on in my life. Wow. 
Verse 37, some said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind have done something if he is here to keep this man from dying? They said, oh, he couldn't, he healed him. Jesus groaned again, verse 38. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Wow, I wonder what he's thinking right now. When he's writing in the sand, those same hands created Adam and now he's standing before a cave fixing to call life out of that cave. He, he's just a short time away from that same type of place himself. In verse 39, the summons of Lazarus. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha's sister, the sister of him that was dead said, Lord, by this time he stinketh. He stinketh. He's rotten. You can't bring. Do not open that do no you know you can see her slow motion no you know Martha's just like no you're fixing to crash this funeral you can't do this the grave robber you know he always crashed the funerals that he went to every time you see Jesus at a funeral in the Gospels it stops being a funeral the widow of Nain he raised her son he says, take away the stone. She says, you can't do this. It's been four days. He said, said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou would see, here it is. Wow, wish we had time. The glory of God. It's all about the glory of God. They took away the stone. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, please, 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 please raise Lazarus. Please help me right now. All eyes are on me. Everybody. Notice what he says. Wow, there's a whole message right here. The first thing out of his mouth, Father, I thank thee. That'll preach, but we don't have time. That thou heardest me, and I knew that thou heardest me always, but because of the people which stand here, I said it, that they may believe. Here it is again. Believe, 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 believe. And he cries with a loud voice, verse 33, Lazarus, come forth. If he wouldn't have called him by name, everybody in the cemetery would have come up out of the ground. If you remember in chapter 5, Jesus said there's going to come a day when the dead are going to hear the voice of the Son of God. He had to call him by name. The dead came forth bound, hand and foot, with grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. This is so cool. I mean, he just hopping out there like a mummy. He can't move. He, he I mean, when Jesus calls us, you come. <laughs> what excuses am I using? What's holding me back today, Lord, from your call? Lazarus didn't let nothing. I mean, he's wrapped up in death clothes, man. He's he doing not to bunny hop, but to mummy hop. He's coming up out of the grave, and Jesus is loose him and let him go. And many of the Jews which came to Mary and seeing the things which Jesus did believed, but... Verse 46. Some believed. Others blabbed. But some of them went their way to the, Philist the Philistines, the Pharisees. They're about the same, one and the same. And told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the, and the Pharisees the council and said, What do we do? What do we? For this man hath done many miracles. Could you, that, that sounds like you could have watched that on the news today. It, that's just as crazy as some of the stuff as I hear on the news today. What do we? This man does many miracles. Um, I don't know, maybe believe. <laughs> Goodness. Verse 48. He says, if we let them alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both. Here's, here's what really matters to them. Our place and nation. It's not about God's place. Not about God's purpose. It was all about them. One of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest the same year, said to them, you know nothing at all. He doesn't either, as we're about to find out. John's going to tell us. You don't know anything at all, nor consider it is, it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation and not for that nation only, but that also... He should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. This guy prophesies and doesn't even know it. You say, well, Gordon, how, how does that all work? I don't know. God used a donkey. 
He's God, right? See, I don't struggle with that part. I, I don't struggle with the control part. He, he's got that down. From that time, verse 53, they took counsel together to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, walked no more openly among the Jews, not because he was afraid. If you remember in John chapter 7, verse 30, his hour had not come. He went out into the country near to the wilderness. I like that. Into a city called Ephraim, and there he continued with the disciples. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand. And many went out of that country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then sought they for Jesus and spake among themselves as they stood in the temple. What think ye? That he will not come to the feast? The scheme because of Lazarus. They, they, they want to kill Jesus now because of this. And now the people are wondering, is he going to come to this feast? Verse 57, now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it, that they might take him. Now, we'll close with this. Josephus, Jewish historian, tells us that during this Passover, some 250,000 lambs were sacrificed. That's a lot of lamb chops. 250,000. Now, we know from the Old Testament that they were to have one lamb per household. If we would assume that there were maybe 10 per household, one could speculate 2.5 million people gathered there around Jerusalem. And standing in the very midst of all of those lambs is the Lamb of God. The Prince of Life. The one that is going to lay down his life, take it up again so that he could give eternal life to as many as were really, really good, moral, upstanding, Christian, caring. I, I'm seeing a few head shakes. Some of you are like, where's he going with this before I blurt it out? No, no, no. As many as believed. As many as believe on him. Placing all of my faith and all of my trust in the Lamb of God that John the Baptist said comes to take away the sins of the world. And he has just called Lazarus. Four days, Martha herself. Lord, if it smells this bad on the outside of this stone, I can only imagine what it smells like behind the stone. And I don't know about you, but my life really did stink before Jesus. But there's a sweetness about him, an aroma about him and if you'll come back next week if Jesus tarries we'll talk a little bit more about that let's pray